Good. Hi, and welcome to this uh, seminar on digital learning design from uh, NMIS Skills. Um, if you're not familiar with NMIS Skills, you can go onto our website, nmis-skills.org, where you can find out more about us. And we've also done a previous webinar all about the project that's up on there for you to watch again if you missed it originally. Um, yeah, Joe, is there anything else you want to highlight before we start? Well, prob probably just introduce myself. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm Joe Wilson, and on my right is a uh, Lewis Ross. Uh, I think the other thing you could usefully go and have a look at as well as the NMIS website uh, and the webinar and slides that tell you about the project uh, is this week you could do a wee Google search and you'll find out that development has actually started on the site where the National Manufacturing Institute of Scotland will be uh, located. And, and without further ado, we're going now to chat about learning design. Yeah, so we're specifically looking at digital learning design because the whole point of the NMIS skills program is to get you more familiar with using digital tools in your teaching practice. So with that in mind, our learning objectives for today are going to be all based around um, digital learning design. So first of all, we're going to try and understand the rationale for and how to design, plan, develop, deliver the curriculum effectively and efficiently. So that's one of the um, learning objectives is based off the new teaching standards that have just come out recently for college staff. Uh, similarly with our second one, which is to learn creative approaches to the, the approaches to the embedding of appropriate digital technology for effective planning, delivery, and assessment of learning. Bit of a tongue test for that one. But um, yeah, so we're just going to be looking at how we integrate digital practice into our learning and, and design of learning. I, I, and I suppose in, in, in all of this, while we're looking at digital practice, a lot of it's just based on, on, on sound learning practice that uh, outcomes and competencies and lesson planning and all of these things uh, aren't, aren't going away. Uh, we're just going to do it in a, in a different way and, and embed new practices and really take on, and I'll use that word, affordances, the affordances that, that technology gives us uh, to do things in different ways and to engage learners in, in, in different ways. Uh, and maybe if we, we chat about things, you know, like uh, acquisition, collaboration, discussion, investigation, practice and production, none of these things are, are none of these things are, are, are new things. Uh, and I think soon we won't be talking about learning technology because actually these are things that you will do with the, the systems that learners and, and you've got in front of you. Uh, and, and actually, gradually, the technology, some of which we're going to mention today, will, will gradually become invisible because it will just be uh, the, the, the way that you do things. Yeah. You know, through acquisition, might be building up our, our lists of, of useful websites. Collaboration, as you'll see in, in, in today's workshop and other workshops, could be through Google Docs or Microsoft 365. Discussion could be, could be synchronous or asynchronous, and some of you will be engaging synchronously with just now, with us just now, and some of us, some of you might be engaging with this workshop asynchronously at a time of your your choice. Uh, all of these things can now be done through 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 technology. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so with that in mind, we're going to talk about some of the kind of design tools that are uh, available to us uh, to use to help. Because the, the first thing with any kind of learning is you've got to be designing it in the first place. You don't just turn up to a classroom and wing it. That's a really bad practice, really. You want to be thinking about beforehand what your learning objectives and everything. So we're going to cover some sort of learning models and design tools even before we go into any technology, because it's really important when using any technology in the classroom that you're not just using it as a gimmick. You're not, you've not gone out and go, oh, VR looks really cool. I've got to find a way of cramming that into a lesson that's almost always going to result in a bad lesson because you designed around the lesson, not around the technology, not around the learning objective. So people are going to go, VR is cool, but they won't learn anything about what your class was about <laughs> because you've done it the wrong way around. So these are kind of some ideas to help you get it, get it the right way around. So do you want to talk about the ADI model, Joe? You're a bit of an expert in this. Well, I'll talk, I'll talk about the models in a minute, but I, th I think th that's always been with us, you know, even when, when the television arrived and people were wheeling trolleys with uh, TVs and uh, VCRs on them into classrooms, sometimes it was done really well, uh, and, and sometimes it was done just to fill some time. Uh, and that's why these, these, these models are important to really give you structure so that when you're adopting technology or use, using things with your learners, uh, you, you've thought through how it's going to impact on their, on their learning, 
uh, and, and, and you plan the, the, their engagement with things. Uh, and, and, and really, what we're tabling here are really, really three things that are worth going to have a look at. Uh, f f first of all, really, the, the ADI model. Uh, and the ADI model is, is really just that, that quality circle that, that you should probably be doing with any kind of learning, whether it's digital or not. You know, that actually what you start off by doing is doing that analysis of, of, of what you're going to try and teach your learners. Uh, you, you, you design the learning you design the learning experience or materials you, you go through that development stage of, of putting it all together uh, and then just as we're doing just now you, you, you deliver it uh, and having delivered it you then have a feedback loop where you come back and you evaluate it and you see you see whether it's worked or not uh, it's not rocket science uh, but if you have a look at that link the ID model you'll see how, how it applies to uh, creating uh, different kinds of online learning experiences. Yeah, I think I think yeah. Lewis is going to open up now. Yes, you can have a look at it. Uh, actually, uh, the website that we've just sent you to uh, gives you a very very useful glossary of of all of the terms around sort of digital digital learning, uh, both the concepts, theories, uh, and, and and different models of learning design, uh, all at your fingertips. Uh, so if you have if you have colleagues that like using lots and lots of different jargon, uh, this is a great jargon buster. You can come here, you can mm -hmm. find out what 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 simple terms like competency based learning uh, or, or more complex terms actually mean. The other resource we're going to show you today is the is the is the pedagogy wheel uh, and pedagogy rather than pedagogy and and pedagogy pedagogy because really I think it, it was developed in the first place around tablet technology, uh, around an iPad probably. Uh, I, 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 what, you've, what you've got there really is, is, is that mapping of all of these tools that could help you with acquisition, collaboration, discussion, investigation, practice and production. I'm using slightly different terms here, uh, but it's another, it's another useful model for you to think about what tools that you've got at your disposal that you can access in your institution, uh, which tools that your, your learners are comfortably, comfortably going to access and are happy to access. Uh, I think at the start of all of these processes is, is that discussion with your class around, here are the different tools that we could use, what are the tools that you're comfortable in using, uh, and that you can you, you can access on your on your on, on your devices. Uh, this might blow your brain when you actually see all, yeah, all, all the different a lot tools of information. Here. Isn't it? <laughs> it is it's kind of you can break it down quite a bit in that you've got your inner kind of learning. Um, what's the word? Kind of objectives, as it were. So applying, analyzing, evaluate, create, remember, understand. So it's it's your steps of Bloom's taxonomy, really, and then it moves out to your action verbs. But then activities you do from that, and then a list of kind of apps. Basically, these ones are for iPads, I think, uh, hence the pad bit. Uh, but it kind of like builds out from there. So always starting at the center of what you're thinking about. You never go out to in, because that's the wrong way of designing your lessons, and you'll end up in, in chaos if you start doing things like that. So um, that's a good tool, that one. And then I think the final tool, if I just bring back up my uh, presentation. And, and, and the final tool is actually based on, on, on a old colleague Dan Laurelard's uh, work. It's been circulating uh, now, now, now for a, a, quite a long time, uh, but it's being refined all the time by uh, both UCL uh, and other partners around the, around the globe. And we've now, we've now arrived at the point where the ABC Design Learning Toolkit, uh, and Lewis will take you in, it'll give you, give you a blog and a description of all the, all, all, all the things that you can do with it. Uh, where I think it's probably most useful, we're just about to show you an online version of it where you can, you can actually use the tools uh, and, and do learning uh, design, but you can use it in a whole raft of different ways. So, so, so some of the most basic ways I've, I've seen it being used is, is, is simply with paper, paper templates or playing cards and getting curriculum teams uh, to sit down and look at their course uh, and when they're looking at their course, think about uh, wh wh where they're going to embed uh, digital learning around, and it's back around that list of words again, ABC Learning Toolkit has embedded in it 
a acquisition, collaboration, discussion, investigation, practice, and production. Uh, and 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 how, how how technology then then supports these kind of activities. So so the learning ABC Learning Design Toolkit gives you a link into really an overview uh, of the of of the process and the goodies that will help you and your either use an individual or use your curriculum team uh, to revisit how, how you're designing your learning experience for learners. Uh, and if you want to go that step further, uh, you can sign up and sign into the learning uh, designer platform that allows you actually, allows you actually to create learning, learning designs. And uh, one, of, one of our colleagues actually has been actively uh, using this. Uh, and you can see on, on screen just now, uh, one of the one of the learning designs they has created. Yeah, so this was uh, by our colleague Julian Hopkins. We should give uh, credit to him because of a very good lesson he's planned. So basically, it's a lesson plan he's made where he's added in his objectives, the time it's going to um, is designed for the lesson. So this was fifty minutes, but he's only put thirty minutes in because this is still a work in progress. He can put in his number of students, um, aims and stuff, and then he starts building activities down here. So he can put in how many students are doing things, what they're doing, and then he can add in actually what the kind of the, your verbs are. So read, discuss, and how those link into the different things. That, so that you'll see then it builds a little pie chart up here of how his different learning uh, activities have, have spaced out over time. So we've got 20% practice, 50% acquisition, and 30% discussion. So from that, you can kind of see how your lesson's planning out. Are you gonna have a lesson where they're actually not gonna be applying their knowledge much, they're just gonna be acquiring it a lot, uh, which yeah, could be fine for a lesson, but if you're wanting to have more interactivity, more opportunities for your students to apply that knowledge, you maybe want more discussion activities and stuff like that. So it's a, it's a really good way of being able to see how your lesson's shaping up and that you're not going too far down one route or the other, depending on what your objectives are, obviously. Um, it's a very useful tool and you can also then download your lesson plan and it'll come in the kind of uh, Microsoft Word format and it'll come down like this and it'll give you your objectives, your descriptions, your aims, outcomes. Um, so you can then just use that as a lesson plan that you can print off and use anytime you're delivering this lesson. Um, very nice if you're doing any kind of uh, teaching observation, if you're uh, still learning in, uh, at the beginning of your practice, very useful tool for that as well. And I think to some of my colleagues that are maybe a bit longer in the tooth might be looking at this thinking, gosh, I don't want to have to do this for every time I step into a classroom. <laughs> uh, and and I, I, actually, where I've seen the ABC Learning Design Toolkit used most effectively, it, it's not lesson by lesson. It's actually looking at that 40 hour or, 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 or in, a, in, a, in a college, you know, now probably 36 hours of, 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 of learning and looking at that unit or even that broader whole course uh, and chunking it up and looking across it as, with a, as a curriculum team uh, and saying, right, where are we going to embed these, these, these good practices in our, in, in our delivery? Uh, so I'll just get the presentation opened up again, which I need to take it out of and restart for some reason. Uh, there we go. So that's a little bit about some of the tools that you can use to help uh, with your design. Um, now we'll talk a bit more about structures. So how you're actually integrating technologies into your lessons. Once you've designed this lesson, how is it going to work? Well, one of the kind of key concepts that comes up a lot with technology and learning is a concept called blended learning. Uh, and the idea of this is that you're not just delivering something through technology only. So it's not an online only course, but you're not just doing it through face-to-face -face learning. You're blending those two styles together. So you're doing a face-to-face -face and online approach. So some of your content might be delivered by your um, institution virtual learning environment. It might just be through um, having stuff that the, your uh, pupils work on at home um, or trainees, depending on which uh, institution you're in. Um, and then you're coming back to class and you're doing activities in class as well. So part of the other thing with blended learning is that you're blending together a bunch of different technologies as well. So in this case, we could be talking about having YouTube clips involved in the classroom or outside of it doing quizzes as well, online quizzes. There's a, a, a whole bunch of different platforms you can do uh, those on, which we'll talk about in a little later in a different webinar. Um, and then you could also be doing uh, feedback from your VLE, you could be using podcasts, social media, and it could also be through mixed methods, so doing collaborative uh, as well as kind of competitive and, and working 
cooperatively as well. So kind of blending together a bunch of different things. It's, it's kind of it's a very broad term. It gets used in a lot of different ways. So we're trying to give you the broadest possible <laughs> definition for this. Yeah. I think so, some people out there will have heard plenty of learning lots of times mm -hmm. and they'll have heard about things like flipped classrooms and a, ho a whole lot of words that, that actually are all, all saying the same thing that, you know, as, as we know that learning takes place in the classroom, but actually beyond the classroom. Uh, and, and it's all about trying to give the learner a much, a much richer and more nuanced, uh, almost individualized or ideally in individualized uh, learning, le learning experience. If you, if, you, if you jump back a slide at your leisure to that link that says the ADDIE model, uh, you, you will get all of these definitions of things like blended learning and the flipped classroom. Uh, and, and really what we're doing uh, in, in this whole series of workshops uh, is we're going to look in, in some detail uh, at YouTube and, and quiz features uh, and, and, and the other tools and social media and other tools and how, how you can use them. But coming back to that ABC learning design, as we're looking at all of these tools, we should all be thinking about acquisition, collaboration, discussion, investigation, uh, practice and production. And that production, whether or not it's uh, the teaching staff creating materials or increasingly as we move forward, it's going to be about learners collaborating and perhaps learners co-creating uh, new, new learning materials. Uh, so that's the teaching staff and the learners working together. Yeah. And one um, topic that uh, Joe mentioned there was the flipped classroom, which um, some of you might have heard of this, some of you might not have. It's, it's a concept that's going to be going around for a while now and it's gaining more traction. And it's this idea that instead of doing a lot of the kind of knowledge transfer in the classroom, so standing up and giving a lecture, instead what you're doing is you're giving your students that material to do at home. So they go away and they read the, the book chapter would be a classic example. And then when they come back into your class, what you're doing is activities that involve um, presenting that knowledge that they've generated or discussing it. So to go back to the book example, go away and read the chapter, come back into the classroom. And what we're going to do is discuss your con concepts that you've brought out from that book chapter or things that you found difficult, things that you found easy. Um, just kind of moving that round from instead of sitting in the class, reading the materials or being lectured at and then going home to do that kind of uh, analysis work, you're doing that in the classroom where you're going to need the help more. Most people can sit and read a book by themselves, um, but they will need help doing the equations. So you're kind of bringing that into the classroom as the idea. And there's various different ways that you can do this. Um, we've got an example here of a course that's um, by one of our colleagues, Fiona Bach where she's integrated these ideas into her actual lesson plan. So she's thought about this before delivering it. She's not just doing it uh, on the fly. Uh, so the ideas here of uh, putting the reading materials, prep them uh, for class and also answering some questions so that when they come into the classroom, they've got those answers ready and then you're discussing the answers that they've already come up with. So it really kind of moves it towards more of a discussion in the classroom instead of, um, that kind of didactic approach, if we want to use some of our words. Another great way of doing this is, the other example we have here is MIT's OpenCourseWare. If you're not familiar with MIT's OpenCourseWare, it can be a really amazing resource for your teaching practice. Um, but it's basically a whole bunch of free learning materials that MIT have put online. So it can be lectures, discussions, video clips, um, images, tons of things. And this one is about kind of climate science. But you can use these materials, say to your students, okay, go away, read through this section on OpenCourseWare, go and look at this video. And then when we come to our class, we're just gonna discuss our ideas about it. Because you know what, the science behind the climate change and stuff like that, the data doesn't change, but our interpretations of the data does. And that's, that's the thing you're trying to get across in your classroom. I, th I, th I think the other, other important bit, and uh, as, as we work through these materials, the materials are all nuanced towards uh, if I said STEM, it's staff work, working in and around areas who will be interested in the uh, National Manufacturing uh, Institute Scotland. Uh, so, 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 it's, so we've deliberately picked some things that we think will, will appeal to these audiences. Uh, I think also simply having something like your YouTube channel. You know, if you had a YouTube channel with some rel relevant clips, and it might be clips that other people have used showing a, a an industrial process or any of these things, 
uh, and then allowing your learners, learners to discuss that before they come to the class will, 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 will help, their, help their learners. Learning. And it's all about making the most of that contact time that you have with your students. Like, as we all know, that's becoming a, a, a scarcer and scarcer resource. So you want to optimize it the best you can. The flip learning approach is, in my opinion, one of the best ways you can do that, I think. Um, so we've kind of talked a lot about the kind of the background knowledge, the design and learning aims and stuff. But what probably a lot of you have come here for is you want to see some cool things that you can actually use in your classroom. And that's what this uh, section is going to cover. We're going to look at some tools and apps and activities that we can really kind of get our teeth into and you can think about um, would this be useful for your learning practice. And again, don't just see something cool and try and cram it into a lesson. Really have a think about how you're going to integrate it into that learning because there are some great ways of, of using these tools. And, and, and I think too, with, with, with that eye on particularly staff that are teaching uh, maths uh, or that type of problem solving, we're, we're, today we're going to chat about some, some, some useful tools in that space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the first ones we're gonna look at is, is mathematics-based um, uh, apps and stuff. The first one I'm gonna show off is a thing called Equatio, which I find really, really cool. Uh, I used to be a physics teacher and this kind of thing would have um, been very useful when I was teaching. So I've got a little uh, example uh, document open here in Google Docs, because this is how this works. It works through Google Docs. And I've got an image here that I've just pasted in. This isn't actually something I've typed. This is an image. I can't edit this at all. Uh, I can move it around, but I can't actually edit the image. I'll just put that back where it was. Uh, what Equatio is, is it basically, you can see at the bottom here is this row of icons. I'll just move my feet out of the way. Um, uh, that will help out with things. Um, so you can do various math things in here. I should also mention before I get started that this is all free to use. There is a paid version which does some advanced stuff, but all the tools I'm showing off here are free. Um, one of the really cool things about Equatio is that, say the screenshot I've got from an old math paper I've been working on, what I can do is use the screen reader function, select it, and what it will do is it'll process it. It's thinking about it right now, and then you Five may lines. be able to hear it. Line one. F prime of three equals limit over A trine. So first of all, it'll be able to read out that text. So if you've got any students who have visual impairment problems, this is really good for being able to correctly interpret uh, mathematical text. It's not just going to read out what the, the letters are. It knows that that means F prime, not F comma, or however other screen readers would read it. But what this is also really cool is it's now, it's taken that image and it's converted it into a format called latex. There's also math ML if you use that. Um, Latex is kind of a programming language used to program mathematics. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with that coming from STEM background, but some of you might not know it. Um, but basically it's a kind of a code looking thing. And if I open this up now and I paste in my Latex, you can see there a bunch of weird characters and letters and the equation here. And what I can do is I can hit insert maths and you'll see it inserts it. So we've got the equation here working now, but what I can also do is I can go in and edit this. Oh, it's not actually H, it's E. So you can take some of those old papers that you've got lying around that you really want to be able to use in an online form and you can scan them in basically using this, which to me, when I saw that, I was like, that is amazing. I wish I'd had that. And then I could have got some of the kids doing stuff more online. It's also got some other really cool tools. It's got, I'll just wait for this to close. Come on, latex, okay. Well, whoops. Um, it's got a voice recognition speech input function, which we'll see if we can give this a go. So this is working earlier. Hopefully it works now. It's always the way with live demos. Okay, E equals MC squared. So it picked up my, my K there. It's having a bit of trouble because I've got the microphone here as well, which is um, finding a bit strange. So what we'll do is we'll pause, we'll delete, and we'll start again. So. E equals MC squared. I don't know why it's having trouble with the MC, but if it does have trouble, you can still go in here and type in the things. But you can use that to, do, to talk out complex uh, equations and usually it'll pick them up quite well. Uh, so that's again very useful if you've got any students with um, mobility problems or fine manipulation problems, they can speak their equations at it. It can also do handwriting recognition, which I won't show off right now because I've not put it on an iPad. If you have an iPad or something like that, you can do that. It can edit graphs and all these kind of things. And obviously it's got an equation editor where you can just go in and edit equations. <laughs> you know, 
pretty basic function, but it can do some really, really cool things. So when I first saw that, that kind of blew my mind a bit. Um, so what I'll do is I'll take us back into our presentation and we'll talk about another mathematical tool, which is called Photomath. So this is an app for phones. I've got it on my Android phone. Uh, what I will do is I'll quickly just get it loaded up. I will show you that I have this equation here. I have written very badly in my handwriting. There uh, we can see the equation, pretty simple. And what I can do is I can take the app, which is just kind of a little scanny phone thing, and I can put it over my equation. It will scan it, it'll pick it up, and it will solve it for me. So, oh, it's, because my handwriting is so bad, it thinks it's got an eye on the end. Let's see if we can get this better. Okay, here we go. So it's now, it's gone through and it's solved that equation. So I'll just hold that up. Hopefully you can see that nicely. So it's, it can basically detect handwritten equations and go through and mathematically solve them. And it'll also, it'll give you steps. And if there's different ways of solving it, you can pick a different way to see it. Now you might be thinking, oh, that's brilliant. Now my student can cheat on the math tests. Well, you know, with an app like this, you wouldn't be using it necessarily to give them and go show me the exact working and stuff like that. It, it can be useful for uh, testing your kind of your understanding of it. So you are stuck on a little problem like, right, why did why does this step happen? You can use it as a teaching aid like that. Um, it's really, really impressive what it can pick up because as I say, my handwriting is bad and it, it can even differentiate between my X's and my multiplies, which is usually something no one, not most humans can't even do that. Um, so it's a really cool little app that can be useful in teaching. Um, and again, free, free to use. And also, you know what, it can be really great if you're teaching and suddenly you go, oh, wait, uh, I don't have my answer sheet with me. Um, uh, better just check my working so I don't embarrass myself in front of my student, which I've nearly done at least a couple of times when dealing with complex physics equations, which is always embarrassing. If you're a bit tired that morning and you're like, oh no, uh, <laughs> what have I done? Uh, but really, really cool apps, that one. I, I really enjoy that one. And, and just goes to show you know, how advanced some of these things are now for free. Well, I think that too, and I, I, and I think if you have a look at the Aname IS website, uh, you'll find particularly uh, on some of the links to all of this, lots and lots of other really useful, really useful examples. Uh, I'm, I'm going to chat just very quickly about about citizen maths. Mm -hmm. uh, citizen maths is interesting, not just in that it provides a free and quite accessible support of math skills for, for, for adult learners. Eh? But it's also interesting back to that bit of learning design. You could look at it two ways. You could look at it as something that you can use quite quickly and easily with, with your learners, like Can Academy and, and other tools, eh? but developed in the UK. Eh? But if you look under the bonnet, it's worth having a look also eh? how it was built. It was built mainly with, with free accessible materials. Uh, so you don't really, you don't always have to be uh, one of the one of the big rich universities to build accessible open learning materials. Uh, and I think if you have a look inside this is maths you'll see something that's accessible and useful uh, as a revision aid for lots of learners. But but also something that we can learn from in terms of in terms, in terms of learning design. Yeah. Um, so we'll have a look at some other apps there now as well. So these ones are all on iOS, but there are kind of equivalent ones that you'll find on Android as well. Um, so we've talked about some kind of quite quite advanced things of, of dealing with maths there, but you can also use your uh, smartphones for very basic things. So a ruler, for example. So this app called Ruler. All it really is, is it basically puts a, a ruler on your screen. So we'll just have a look here. Um, so this is kind of the kind of output you get. It basically just puts measurement things on the side of your screen. It can be very, very useful if you're doing a kind of technical class and you just really want to quickly measure something and you don't have a ruler nearby. It does happen. I, I used to lose equipment when I was teaching all the time. And you just go, all oh, right, okay, what's the actual size of that? Right, there we go. Um, very, very useful, pretty simple. Um, nothing, nothing too exciting about that one, but very useful. But, but I think all, all of the, the, the three things here, uh, and there are versions available for Android and, and, and Microsoft, I think of all, 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 all three tools, uh, it brings mathematics and calculations uh, fro into the real world, mm -hmm. uh, that you can suddenly use the curve of a chair or the corner of a room uh, or, or actually more sophisticated things, you know, bits of machinery and, and quite intricate measurement. 
you can suddenly start demonstrating uh, the, the, the geometry of things, if you like. And, and that's both what the, the ruler tool can do. You could, you could quick, quite quickly calculate how many floor tiles uh, that a room, a room might need. Uh, but you're doing it in real life. You're not doing it on, on with, with, with some paper-based exercise. Uh, the ge geoma geometry uh, pad, uh, you, you can quite quickly do, show people, uh, you know, the, the calculations that are required to, in a curve or to build a dome or to do all of these kind of, kind of things. Uh, or, or doing areas on maps is another thing that geometry pads quite good for and, and like, visualizing what these equations mean which can be very hard for some students of going okay what does this 6x plus 7y actually mean well this is what the graph looks like and this is the circle rolling on the graph and you know it's, it's kind of all these things are very good for visualizing making it real which a lot of students yeah. can struggle with even adult learners can really struggle with that as well um, and then i think the last one of the ios ones that we want to highlight is um oops let's just get back to where we were is this one called Measure, which is super cool, I think. And so this is an augmented reality app. I'll just bring up this video of it in action so you can see what it actually does. I'll just full screen this red one. So, quiet this person down. Um, so basically, it can measure real world objects. So here we are, that you just point your camera at an object and it will give you the dimensions of it. So again, really useful for that example Joe, Joe was saying there of, of bringing maths into real world things. Or it could be you're doing some technical um, skills and you want to know the size of a park. Well, I'll just get this camera out. There we go. Measure the park size. Nice and easily done. You can speed up those bits of the lessons or, or instruction where, you know what, we're not talking about how to measure something. We're trying to do some other skill and the measuring part is what's slowing it down. Well, we can just use one of these uh, quick tools to quickly get in and um, do the thing that we need and then get back on with our lesson. Uh, really nice and simple. And the other nice thing about a lot of these kind of apps is it's getting used to using this technology in the classroom. They're not hard to integrate into your lessons. I think you can all easily think of how you could use this in a lesson without altering your lesson plans at all. It just kind of slots in there. And it also gets the idea of a lot of people are scared of using smartphones in a classroom because they think they're disruptive things and their pupils are just going to be looking at the internet or whatever. It gets you used to how you have, right, this is a thing we're using these phones for now and now we put them away which can be an important thing to establish when you're doing any kind of teaching that you're not just mucking about with phones, right? Phones have been used for this activity, now they're away. Because they are a very important tool. I mean, this, this thing that I have here has more computing power than the entire Apollo space program. So why are we not leveraging that? Um, I think as we, as, as, as we go along, I said there are other examples on the, on the website. We'll give you more examples. Uh, We'll also ask you to share some of the examples that, that you use, probably in an open Google Doc or, or equivalent. Uh, but one of the things you should also be doing is, uh, as your learners come into the classroom, some, some of your learners will already have uh, perhaps other tools that we haven't listed that, 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 that they're using in their, in their everyday uh, learning. So chat to your learners too about how you might use these tools uh, in the classroom. Yeah, and um, we'll just have a quick look at this one here now, which is called Metaverse, which is an, uh, an augmented reality or app. I'll just show you how it kind of looks in practice. This one's kind of quite deep and allows you to do a lot of things. It allows you to kind of see things in the world. So that here's this fox standing on a table. And then when you interact with it, it actually turns into a thing that looks like a Bruno Mars concert. That's this orb that you can go inside of. And your students can kind of design these. So you could use this as a kind of a learning tool of, of what they're doing in the class. And you can create games, scavenger hunts, interactive stories. Um, I recommend go away and read this, uh, watch this video yourself because we're not going to play through it all now. We don't have time. Um, but it's a really interesting app of trying to use that augmented reality stuff in your class, which can get really exciting and, and get learners thinking in a different space. You can start thinking more three dimensionally, which is again can be quite hard for people to move from that two D. Right? Okay, what well, when we're doing stuff three dimensionally, this will get you thinking about the space around you and geotagging and all this kind of stuff it might be a cool way for learners to build their own induction into a course for the for the next group of students that are coming into your yeah, classroom indeed um, so we'll just move on now and talk quickly about making your own personalized toolkit um, this might sound obvious but it's something that people forget to do a lot is like when you're finding all these cool apps and stuff start putting them somewhere start creating yourself a little toolkit a little document where it could just be a uh, Google Sheets, such as the one we've got here, 
uh, where you're just listing them all, what they're useful for, how can you use them? And then you can share this with your colleagues, get your colleagues to add to it. So you're building up this repository of things you use. You don't have to constantly say, all right, Joe, what was that thing that, uh, it was like a measuring stick or something? Well, you've got them all written down and you can start classifying them. It seems like a simple idea. But a lot of time people get overexcited about things, forget about it, and then they're not, this is a great way of sharing your practice with your colleagues and stuff. Like here's some really cool apps that you can use. Yeah, and I, and I think back to, we'll keep coming back to our, our, our theme, learning design, ABC learning design. Uh, one of the first bits is about acquisition. Uh, and and, and as, you're, as, you're, as you're acquiring tools, you, you want to be able to, 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 to store them so you, you can share them with, with, with your learner, learners. And, and of course, that lists live, so there's quite a lot of useful, another rich, useful resource that you, you can tune in to and have a look at after this webinar is finished. Yeah. Um, so speaking of trying to integrate this into your practice, what, what we're going to be doing throughout these webinars is giving you a kind of a little teacher challenge, we're calling them teacher challenges. So it's to try and get you to go out and give these things a go instantly and giving you an idea of how you can do that. So instead of just going, oh, that's quite good, I don't know if I can do that yet. Here's a really simple way that you can use a bit of technology in your classroom, just you, as you do in any kind of other presentation. And it's just getting this idea of using the phones out and splitting that time when they're being used, when they're not being used. The idea with this one is you basically you create a slide deck where you put some errors in it. So you put like four mistakes in it and then you split your class up into teams. They use their phones with a buzzer noise and then they can just press the buzzer to buzz in and go, I spotted a mistake. And then you get a point if you spot the mistake, two points if you correct it. Really, really simple thing to do. You're just using the technology in a very kind of simple way that's not going to be disruptive to class. Uh, there's other ways you could do this. You could go and actually find like little buzzers and stuff like that, but it's just using it on your phone. If you've got those there, why don't you use this technology? So you can easily get buzzer apps that are there already. Um, so go out and give that a try. Or if you want, instead of doing this, go and use one of those other apps that we've used. Go and try and give it a try this week. And then on the forums, you can go and discuss with other people um, how you did, what went wrong, what went right. Mostly it's going to be go right, but you might want some tips on how to use it in different ways. Speaking of um, kind of cooperative team-based things, we're going to kind of talk a little bit about cooperation in, in learning and all this as well, because it kind of folds into all this quite nicely. Do you want to cover that a bit, Joe? Yeah, I mean, I think, we, we, again, back to that, that learning design bit and moving, moving it back into that space, you know, that collaboration, cooperation is, is, is a key to that, the, the, the future models of, of, of learning. Uh, you can differentiate, you can give people with Google Docs or with, with, with a whole range of different platforms, you can, you can see your learners a whole range of different tasks. Uh, and you can actually watch them in real time or asynchronously, you can watch them collaborating and building up uh, knowledge. And you can do this in a whole range of different ways. Uh, again, you'll find on the, on, the, on, on, on the website a range of tools that you, you can use. Uh, the other thing th this all lends itself to is, of course, peer review. Uh, that not only not only can you you, you help your learners, uh, your learners can help each other a lot more. Uh, and that type of practice is very very normal in a in a design studio uh, in the graphics department. Uh, but to this point, it's been less normal in the maths class. That might be regarded as cheating, or 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 or, or, or perhaps in the the English class, so people were comparing essays. Uh, at the end of the day, people have got to produce their own 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 work clearly, uh, and they've got to demonstrate their own mastery of a subject. But by using these tools wisely, you can really drive on drive on a, drive on that learning circle, uh, and and I think that that slide is really just there. Uh, to see that, to get other people to think about how you might give the class safer topics to pull things together. Yeah, uh, I'm afraid we're running out of time here, so I'll just have to quickly wrap things up and say, um, we hope you got some useful tips from there and check the NMIS website for more useful links and things. And we'll hopefully see you in the next webinar. Bye now. See you later.